Friends and travelers, however you've arrived, I bid you welcome. Here at Let's Be Frank, we're about lives, and above all, living well. I don't expect a podcast hosted by Benjamin Franklin could be about anything else. In my lifetime, I pursued the practice of moral improvement like a science, recording my successes and, yes, oftentimes reveling in my failings. It's my hope with our weekly almanac to give to a curious world delicious morsels of history in quick, easy-to-digest installments. Perfect for a sit in your favorite chair or a morning walk to work. At the end of each installment, I like to wrap it all up in a neat little lesson that you can apply to your own life, inspired by the events, stories, and personalities shared in each episode. So sit back, relax, and together... Let's make history. Greetings and salutations, dear listener. Welcome to the Season 2 finale of Let's Be Frank, an auditory almanac for the curious mind, with me, your faithful friend and host, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, printer. I'm grateful you stopped in today, my dear friend. A reminder to rate and review us to make it easier for new members of our Junto to find us. Give us a follow on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at BFranklinLive. And if you wish to support the history we make every day, consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in our show notes. With that out of the way, let's get to our thrilling finale. For purposes of good order... This podcast is composed of several primary sources associated with Ben Franklin's life, knit together to collect it all into one narrative on a cohesive theme. Today's episode is the thrilling finale we've been working towards all season, discussing the Boston Tea Party on the 250th anniversary of that event. Dear listener, was anything missing from last week's installment? Did you get to the end of the episode and realize... Where's the lesson from this week's installment? Did it leave you feeling perhaps incomplete or more than that, confused? Now, my beloved Junto, I will confess this was somewhat deliberate. I wished to deviate from our rules and our orders or the body of law that we have constructed together to demonstrate a lesson in and of itself. When Parliament asserted the right to tax the colonies and deviate from the system of common law that had been agreed upon between subject and crown since the inception of colonial law, they left the people consistently confused, consternated, and rather than appease those people to further enforce those ties of consanguinity and love, they continued to endeavor to constrain them by force, which leads us to the pageantry of today. Our liberty and life is now invaded, and freedom's brightest charms are darkly shaded. But we will stand and think it noble mirth to dart the man that dare oppress the earth. How grand the scene no tyrant shall oppose, the tea is sunk in spite of all our foes. A noble sight to see the accursed tea mingled with mud and ever for to be, for king and prince shall know that we are free. Bostonian sons, keep up your courage good, or die like martyrs in fair, free-born blood. The poem comes from a newspaper dated December of 1773, celebrating the events that would take place 250 years ago from where we sit now. When last we left the story, the people of Boston were gathering in meeting houses, endeavoring to determine what action would be taken regarding the tea sitting idle in Boston Harbor. The first account from today's installment would come from an impartial observer of the events that transpired, taken from a Boston Gazette, December 20th, 1773. Having accidentally arrived at Boston upon a visit to a friend the evening before the meeting of the body of the people on the 29th of November, curiosity and the pressing invitations of my most kind host induced me to attend the meeting. I must confess that I was most agreeably, and I hope that I shall be forgiven by the people if I say so, unexpectedly entertained and instructed by the regular, reasonable, and sensible conduct and expression of the people there collected, that I should rather have entertained an idea of being transported to the British Senate 
than to an adventurous and promiscuous assembly of people of a remote colony. Were I not convinced by the genuine and uncorrupted integrity and manly hardihood of the rhetoricians of that assembly, that they were not yet corrupted by banality and debauched by luxury? The body of the people determined the tea should not be landed, the determination was deliberate, was judicious, the sacrifice of their rights of the union of all the colonies would have been the effect had they conducted themselves with less resolution. On the committee of correspondence they devolved the care of seeing their resolutions reasonably executed. That body, as I had been informed by one of their members, had taken every step which prudence and patriotism could suggest to effect the desirable purpose but were defeated. The body once more assembled on December 14th. I was again present. Such a collection of the people was to me a novelty. Near 7,000 persons from several towns, gentlemen, merchants, yeomen, and others, respectable for their rank and abilities, and venerable for their age and character, constituted the assembly. They decently, unanimously, and firmly adhered to their former resolution, that the baleful commodity which was to rivet and establish the duty should never be landed. To prevent the mischief, they repeated the desires of the committee of the towns that the owner of the ship should apply for a clearance. It appeared that Mr. Roch had been managed and was still under the influence of the opposite party. He resisted the request of the people to apply for a clearance for his ship, and an obstinacy which, in my opinion, bordered on stubbornness. Subdued at length by the peremptory demand of the body, he consented to apply. A committee of ten respectable gentlemen were appointed to attend him to the collector. The succeeding morning, the application was made, and the clearance refused with all the insolence of office. The body meeting the same morning by adjournment, Mr. Roch was directed to protest in form and then apply to the governor for a pass. Mr. Roch executed his commission with fidelity, but a pass could not be obtained, His Excellency excusing himself in his refusal that he should not make the precedent of granting a pass till the clearance was obtained, which was indeed a fallacy, as it had been unusual with him in ordinary cases. Mr. Roch, returning in the evening of December 16th, reported as above. The body then voted his conduct to be satisfactory, and recommending order and regularity to the people, dissolved. Previous to the dissolution, a number of persons supposed to be the aboriginal natives from their complexion approaching near the door of the assembly gave the war whoop, which was answered by a few in the galleries of the house where the assembly was convened. Silence was commanded, and a prudent and peaceable deportment again enjoined. The natives repaired to the ships which entertained the pestilential teas and had began their ravage previous to the dissolution of the meeting. They applied themselves to the destruction of this commodity in earnest and in the space of about two hours broke up about 342 chests and discharged their contents into the sea. A watch, as I informed, was stationed to prevent embezzlement and not a single ounce of teas was suffered to be purloined or carried off. It is worthy of remark that although a considerable quantity of goods of different kinds were still remaining on board the vessels, no injury was sustained. Such attention to private property was observed, that a small padlock belonging to the captain of one of the ships being broke, another was procured and sent to him. I cannot but express my admiration of the conduct of these people. Uninfluenced by party or any other attachment, I presume I shall not be suspected of misrepresentation. The East India Company must console themselves with this reflection, that if they have suffered, the prejudice they sustain does not arise from enmity to them. A fatal necessity has rendered this catastrophe inevitable. The landing the tea would have been fatal, as it would have saddled the colonies with a duty imposed without their consent, in which no power on earth can affect. Their strength, numbers, spirit, and illumination render the experiment dangerous, the defeat certain. The consignees must attribute to themselves the loss of the property of the East India Company. Had they reasonably quieted the minds of the people by a resignation, all would have been well. The custom house and the man who disgraces his majesty by representing him, acting in confederacy with the inveterate enemies of America, stupidly opposed every measure concerted to return the tea. That American virtue may defeat every attempt to enslave them 
is the warmest wish of my heart, an impartial observer. Now, being a newspaper man, I think it entirely probable that the impartial observer should be anything but, instead a propagandist meant to venerate the actions of the few who took it upon themselves to move the dial of revolution forward. By the end of the actions on the 16th of December, 1773, a fortune of East India tea would be destroyed, the equivalent of $2.5 million in your modern terms. Such a quantity of tea was destroyed that it in fact affected the flavor of the fish in Boston Harbor for weeks to come. And the actions of that tea party would cause ripples of similar tea parties to take place over the next year throughout the colonies of North America. What that action would also do in proper Newtonian mathematics would cause an equal and opposite reaction from the Parliament of Great Britain. They would put forward the coercive acts, called in the colonies intolerable acts. They would close that harbor until the value of the tea should be paid off. They would quarter further soldiers in homes, and they would remove Massachusetts civil government. They would set the precedent that in the name of order, our very right to represent ourselves can be removed. 250 years, my beloved Junto. It is not a very long time. In fact, the generations between now and then could likely be counted upon two hands. I think it fitting as we close our second season, reflecting on everything we have done together over the past few months. Silly dances on the internet, interviews with prestigious scholars, appeals not only to the mind but also to the heart and to the spirit that we look ahead to the season to come. We look ahead to the anniversaries. We look ahead to the anniversaries we'll be undertaking over the next few years as we march to 20 and 26. I think it puts to mind a wonderful lesson to wrap up not only this installment, but also our second season. As we follow the road to revolution in our 250th anniversary, my beloved Honto, look to the history that we're making in our own time. Look to how we might play a better role. Look to how we might play a role in it. And in your thoughts, and in your deeds, and in your actions, my dear friends, every day choose to be a little more revolutionary. I look forward to seeing you in our third season, beginning towards the end of February. We have a great many things in store, my beloved friends. For now, that's all for this season. I would that we had more hours in the day, but as always, we have nothing but time between us. Resource materials and images from this week's episode can be found in the journal section of bfranklinlive.com. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok at bfranklinlive, and Let's Be Frank, an auditory almanac for the curious mind on Facebook. Love the wit and wisdom of Let's Be Frank, Consider supporting our Junto by joining our Patreon today. You can find the link to it in today's show notes. And, dear listener, spread the word. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your horse, I don't care. Let's make our intellectual Junto grow. And now, dear listener, our time together must come to an end. Fare thee well. And always remember, when you're good to others, you're best to yourself. Until we meet again, I remain your humble and obedient servant, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, printer. Stay curious, my friends. <laughs>